refreshing, beautiful time. It's just a, a wonderful psalm to sort of immerse yourself in and to think about how wonderful the kingdom's going to be. And then we looked at Isaiah 65, our last one, which was the whole idea of a new age that was going to come. It says a new heaven and a new earth. It's not speaking about we're going to have a different planet. It's speaking about a new age where Christ is going to be king, even longer lifespan for mortals. And we also dealt with the idea of there will be mortals alive in the kingdom that are alive when Jesus returns that don't know anything about the gospel, that survive Armageddon. And yet there will also be immortals that will be able to help and guide them. And we covered off on that, particularly in Isaiah 65, because it says in there that, you know, if somebody calls, then I will answer, God says. And we said, well, how does that happen? You know, Jesus is not going to run around the world to every single person that's got problems. It's going to be his immortal angels that help administer that kingdom. So there's going to be a real job for real people to do um, in the kingdom. And it's going to be a wonderful, fruitful, satisfying time. And we covered off, too, that it was going to be a return to conditions before man had sinned. So it's just a wonderful vision that we were left with, I think, of after the end of our last talk. So what we want to do is deal now with the, uh, with the title, Why You Want to Be There, and make it a little bit more personal and say, OK, we all have things in our own life. We have things going on. We have issues. We have whatever it might be. Um, and just go through some examples, and these are examples only, just to get us thinking about, okay, we've dealt with the framework of the kingdom and how wonderful the time's going to be, but then just think for you or for me what that actually will mean to us and give us a bit more impetus to say, yes, I want to be there, rather than just being sort of a, a distant destination that you look at in a travel catalogue or something like that. This is going to be something that you really can see yourself in and that it's really an answer to your life now. And so we want to deal just first of all with that quote um, that we looked at tonight, because it's a bit of a gloomy one <laughs> that we had read from a, a Kingdom Night, um, Ecclesiastes 5 and 6, and just a couple of points we want to deal with on that. So if you've got Ecclesiastes 5 already still open there, there's a, a repeated phrase that comes out, I've got three times in that particular section that we read, um, and it comes out many times in Ecclesiastes, and that's that term, under the sun. And that's verse 13, I've got mine coloured in, verse 18, and then chapter 6 and verse 1. So what Ecclesiastes, the writer here, is dealing with is life under the sun. And when he says that, that's his little code, if you like, for people without their sights lifted to God. The beholding the sun, he, he deals with as well, when they're actually looking to God. It's more people with their heads lowered and they're just doing everyday life on a mortal level without God in the picture. And we want to see that that's not really a good thing to go about and to have because it just leads to death. And that's what Ecclesiastes is at pains to, the teacher here is at pains to point out. And so, so, for example, verse 13, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth the son, and there is nothing in his hand. And as he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labour which he may carry away in his hand. And so we're taught by that, aren't we, that no matter how rich we might be, at the end of the day, we die. And as far as Ecclesiastes goes, it doesn't actually give us the answer in this particular book particularly. It's more there pointing at under the sun, this is how life is. So we've got this framework in the back of our mind of what the kingdom's going to be like and immortality in that kingdom. And this is a real contrast. And this is what people living in today's world without God and God's completely thrown out the door in most cases, this is what the reality of their life is. No matter how rich they might be and whatever space shuttles they can send into space and afford lands and countries of their own, at the end of the day, they return, it says in, naked as they came. So that's pretty sad. Now most of us aren't probably rich, that might not strike a chord with us as such. We might not be full of riches and think, well I, I, that's not a problem to me. Um, but what has struck me home recently, I guess, with um, you know, events in our family and things, that, and looking at, I guess, the next generation above me when it comes to sort of my age, is really comes in chapter 6, that evil which he, which he saw under the sun. And it is common among men. It's very common. 
that a man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honour, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof. And a stranger eateth it. This is a vanity and it is an evil disease. And so we have somebody here, and even if they're not particularly rich, but they've got substance, they've got houses, they've got means, they've got, you know, you could have you know, enough to live comfortably, which is very common in Australia. Australia is a great place to live. And yet we might get to a certain age or a certain disease hits and all of a sudden, it doesn't matter how much we've got in the bank, we can't go on that holiday we really wanted to. We can't just do that basic thing. We can't even manage to walk down to the beach if we want to. You know, we haven't got power in our limbs like we used to or whatever the case might be that's come, that health issue that's come upon us. And there's no going back on that. There's, there's no, you know, oh, another couple of weeks and I'll be fine or... And you know, when, we, when we're young, we usually bounce back from whatever it might be, and we're all good. But he saw this, and he said it was common. It was a common sight that the teacher saw in Ecclesiastes, and it was an evil that he saw. He calls it an evil, an evil under the sun, that no matter how wealthy or even just how, how fit and you know, prosperous they were, a time would come when they might not have the power to eat, or in other words, partake of what their substance is and actually use it for good or, or even for ill. The, 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 it's a very, very sad picture that's painted here. But when we deal with it in the context of why you want to be in the kingdom, it's just such an amazing hope, isn't it, that the Bible points to. So Ecclesiastes here has sights lowered with people looking at you know, everyday life, God's not in the picture, and this is the outcome to them. And so we want to we'll contrast that with the future and God's kingdom. And so we can't do any better than just um, going to Romans 8 when it comes to contrasting that with Ecclesiastes. So you can read through Ecclesiastes and and it can be pretty dour because he's dealing with mainly life under the sun. His head lowered. And a key word that he keeps using through Ecclesiastes is the vanity of all this. What's What's the point? You get all these riches, can't do a thing with it in the end. Can't take it with you. Some might not even end up with it, you know, and life is just this vanity. And by what he means is a vapour. Just something there for a little time and it's gone. Well, Romans, Paul writing Romans clearly had Ecclesiastes in mind when he wrote it, but he raises it to the next level and gives us the hope of why we want to be there in the kingdom. Because this kingdom is the answer to that problem, that evil that's common among men. And so he deals with it. He says, he talks about, oh, and he was one that had so much suffering in his life. And he just says, verse 18 of chapter 8 of Romans, I reckon, he says, that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. So you think of that. He went through so much suffering, shipwrecks, beatings, imprisonments, whatever it might be, way more than we ever would. And he says, it's worth nothing compared to the glory that's coming. So he had his kingdom vision really strong. Why he wanted to be there, he could sit and talk to you about it all day, why he wanted to be there. Okay? He said, it's not going to be anything to the glory that's revealed, that's going to be revealed in us. And he didn't mean by that that he's going to be this, you know, amazingly proud person in the kingdom. He just said, it's going to be God's glory, but it's going to be in me. I'm going to be able to show God's glory to the world, to those people that we need to bring up out of the dust that have survived Armageddon, preach the gospel to people that didn't know. And that's the sort of vision that he had. And he said that glory is going to be revealed in us. And so he says in verse 19, for the earnest expectation of creation, in a better term, of the creation, it says, waits for the showing, the manifestation of the sons of God. It's, it's almost like our planet is burdened down and just grinding along going downhill and it's waiting, it's longing for something better. And that is a normal human thing, isn't it? Sort of looking for something better in life. What's the future going to hold? Is there something beyond this life? How are we so intelligent and so gifted with all our thoughts and ways that we just somehow came about by chance? And so he there says, creation itself is groaning for that release from this bondage that we have. So verse 20, for the creation was made subject to vanity. So there's that word from Ecclesiastes, and I believe he had this in mind when he was writing it. This, it was made subject to vanity. So yes, under the sun, there's all this vanity that's out there. All right? 
And he says, not willingly, like people don't, aren't subject to this willingly, but he says, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Now that takes a bit of chewing through, but the him is their God. So God has actually allowed our vanity, our condition to be as it was from the fall, because we deserve that. <laughs> Adam and Eve sinned, there was a fall, but God's working through that disability that we've got of sin and death and mortality. He's working through that so that we can have something better. Rather than just giving up and saying, that was a bad project, man sinned, let's try something else. No, God's working through that. He subjected us still to that vanity that he promised when man was given that commandment in the garden. They sinned, he subjected us to that vanity, but he's working through that with hope in mind. By reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. And then it's just beautiful. And this is where it soars way above the scope of Ecclesiastes. He just says, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's just such a wonderful phrase, isn't it? And a wonderful thought to have, that we're going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption into this glorious liberty for the children of God. And there is a note there, isn't it? Glorious liberty of the children of God. So that, there's an onus there, isn't there, to, to work out well, what does that mean? How can I become a child of God? Does that just mean everybody? What does that mean? Okay. And so he says, verse 22, for we know, he says, it's, it's common knowledge, you know, it's common to man, it said in Ecclesiastes, we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. They actually had the Holy Spirit gifts back in his day. He says, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. They were still mortal and grew old and died, even though they did have, says he, the first fruits of the Spirit. And then he says, for we are saved by hope. That was his anchor that got him through and his picture that he looked forward to. But hope, he says, that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he get hope for? In other words, he says, we don't see it now. We can't point to it and say, that's it. But we can certainly read about it now and we can certainly hope and pray for it and have confidence in God that it's going to come. And so we've got this wonderful vision that he had where with all this groaning and travailing and vanity that's there in the world around us, he says that's actually part of what God has allowed us to go through so that the sons of God, those that want to be associated with the Lord Jesus Christ, can come through that and have this glorious liberty from corruption and the bondage that we have. It's just beautiful, beautiful treatise, if you like, the answer to Ecclesiastes that's there in the New Testament in Romans, where he picks up some of the thoughts of Ecclesiastes but brings it to a whole new level for those that are now looking towards the Son and looking for something a lot better through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's an, that could be an answer to you. You could have problems and health issues and, and, or start to see age coming on. That's why the kingdom of God, why you want to be there. That's certainly an answer for us all. Um, another one's a, a bit odd, but it really does affect many people or certainly some proportion of the population at some time or other in their life or even for their whole life. And that is idea that happened to Joseph. And that's being falsely accused. So this is another angle of why I want to be in the kingdom. So Genesis 39. If we go to Genesis 39. We're not going to go through the whole story. But you might know it well. Joseph, after being completely sold into slavery by his own brethren, if that wasn't bad enough, he tries to do the right thing by God and worked really hard for his master, Potiphar, an officer. And he was so diligent, so godly, that Potiphar just didn't even know what cars he had in the drive. He didn't know anything about his possessions. Everything was up to Joseph. He knew everything would be absolutely squared away and completely trusted and relied upon Joseph. And his master, it says, was just, it saw that Yahweh was with him, verse 3 of Genesis 39, and that Yahweh made all that he had to prosper in his hand. The only problem he had was Potiphar's wife. She also thought he looked great too. And try as she might, 
she couldn't seduce him. And so she ended up cooking up this story that ended up with Joseph in prison and accused falsely of something that he hadn't done. Now, we know the end of that story. Joseph didn't for many years. Uh, he's in prison for something he hasn't done, been falsely accused of, and he didn't know if that's how it's all going to end. All right? And there are certainly people in life that go through under that sort of cloud. And yet Joseph retained his integrity and his faith in God. He had hope that there was something better. He didn't know, other than the dreams he'd had that saw that it was going to turn around, he didn't know how it was all going to work out. And yet he committed himself to God and knew that things would work out. And so for some people, that is just a wonderful, wonderful blessing that's going to happen in God's kingdom where we have a true and righteous judge who doesn't just look after the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his ears, the Bible says, but with righteousness he can judge, okay, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. That was from Psalm 72 that we looked at that last time. So he can look into the hearts of mankind and all those wrongs that might have been there in the past are absolutely righted, that there is true righteous judgment that is completely and utterly transparent because it's been judged by somebody that knows really what happened. Okay, So that might be somebody's thoughts about the kingdom, that I cannot wait to be there with this burden that seems to be weighing me down. I've got no proof one way or the other but I've just been falsely accused, okay? And so here we've got somebody who, who's looking and longing for the kingdom just for that fact alone, apart from all the other beautiful and wonderful things the kingdom's there. But trying to make this personal, trying to make this what this might mean to you. Another one is when you think about would be King David. Like we've got David, haven't we? Man after God's own heart. And if we go to 2 Samuel 23, he's sort of looking back on his life. We might know the problem that David had, that as good as he was, he had that traveller talks about in the parable that Nathan told him, traveller of this man that comes and, and takes away, and he takes this ewe lamb and, and offers it for the traveller. Sin to him was like a traveller. He, he was a man whose heart was set upon God all his life, and yet he had this one weak moment, didn't he, that the record tells us all about. It's an, an tell-all. It tells everything that happened. Okay? Horrible time for David in his life. And a sin that he had to take to his grave with him. God forgave him for that sin, and yet he had consequences that plagued his family from then on. So that's something, isn't it? He's got this real thing just hanging over his head. And you, Anybody reading through the life of David knows it's completely different after that sin with Bathsheba. And his also taking of the life of Uriah by pretty foul means uh, in making sure he was at the forefront of a battle and that he would be slain by the enemy. So effectively, he was complicit to the murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. And so he does say, he, he sort of reflects a bit upon his house before God in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel. And he just, he, you can tell David, he calls him the sweet psalmist of Israel there, Okay, so in verse 1, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, and the man who was raised up on high. God had raised him from a shepherd to being the king. And the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. And these next words are just absolutely some of his best. The spirit of Yahweh spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me, He that rules over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by the clear shining after rain. That's what he was looking for, a just and righteous ruler that was perfect and that it was going to be a morning without clouds. And he had plenty of clouds in the last half of his life. And it was going to be like that clear light that you see in a beautiful morning. He said it's going to be just so wonderful that time the refreshing that's going to come upon the earth with the righteous rule of, of his son that had been promised to him. And then he goes on and says in verse 5, come back to earth, although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. 
For this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. So it didn't seem in his life like things were happening towards that direction. And we're still thousands of years on from David, and it still hasn't happened. So it doesn't seem to be growing, it doesn't seem to be happening. But he is absolutely certain that the time God's kingdom is going to be there, and boy did he want it. Yes, he wanted it. He says, my house isn't so with God. My, by that he doesn't mean his bricks and mortar, he means his, his um, family. Yep, it's not the way it should be with God. Yes, things have gone wrong in my life. And yet God's got this everlasting covenant that he's made with me. And it's ordered in all things and sure. It's absolutely sure it's going to happen. And he says, this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he made it not to grow. So he doesn't see the growth of it in his life. He couldn't even build the temple he wanted to build for God. And yet he prepares his heart out to make sure that he's got building materials for his son to do that. And yet he knows that somehow... Somewhere in the future, God's word is going to come to pass. There's going to be a kingdom with a son and he's going to reign upon his throne in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's a wonderful vision for somebody that isn't falsely accused, that actually has done some pretty grievous wrong in his life. Another one we could put with that would be Paul. Paul, the great missionary that went through the whole Roman world. He was there complicit with the murder of Stephen and many others of the saints before he turned to Christianity. He, he had a lot on his conscience that was there. And he, he talks about himself as being one of the worst sinners, looking back on his earlier life. And yet he just had that Damascus conversion, as we call it, and he turned around and just followed God with all his heart and looked forward to the time when the kingdom was going to be there. And knowing that all those, all those things that had been done in the past were going to be forgiven and he was going to have a place. He says he has fought a good fight and finished the course and kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for him a crown of righteousness. So he knew that was going to be the outcome. He knew that was going to be the case and he's just so much looking forward to that. And it doesn't mean the initial part of the kingdom is going to be easy, is it? David meeting Uriah, having a coffee with him. Well, it's going to be tough, isn't it? There's going to be a time where justice is done and judgment is done, but in God's mercy shines through that. So it's not like they're just going to live on different islands somewhere and don't see each other. Okay, The kingdom's not a time for hiding sins that have been before, but it's a time where things are completely reconciled with God and with each other. There's lots of those reconciliations, I'm sure, that will happen in the kingdom. It says sometimes some men's sins go before to judgment and others they follow after. Some we don't know anything about, some we know everything about. And there's going to be this wonderful time, isn't there, after that, when people just so completely and wonderfully blown away with the mercy of God and the provision of his son and what his son has done for us, that these things that have happened in their lives are going to take their rightful place, aren't they? And in the scope of eternity and the glory that God's going to bestow and immortality that's going to fill our bodies, those things will be distant memories, won't they? And there'll be a real work to do in the kingdom, like we talked about in our last talk, where we can get on and just have this wonderful burden lifted and it'll be like a glorious morning without clouds as the tender grass springing out of the earth by the clear shining after rain. And that's exactly how Paul um, uh, Peter talks about it uh, when he's giving a speech in Acts. Um, just go to Acts chapter 3 this wonderful refreshing that's going to come upon the earth. So all these, all these men of God, they just had this wonderful vision of what that kingdom was going to be like. I won't just say, oh, there's going to be a structure to the kingdom and this is how it's going to kind of square up and this is what the government's going to be like. And, you know, it wasn't as stilted as that. They had a real vision of how that really affected their life and their, their vision of what was going to be like. And so we have a similar sort of vision to David when he tells the people there to repent. Verse 19 of chapter 3 of Acts. It's just one of his speeches. And he, so he says, Repent therefore, ye therefore. You've just killed the Son of God. He says that in the verses before. You've killed the Son of God. You've got that on your conscience. But God here, only 40 days later, is extending mercy to these people. They've just killed his son. His blood be on us and on our children. And yet God is here 40 days later 
or so extending mercy to those that have actually killed his own son and being complicit in that act. That's, that's the mercy of God for people that repent. It doesn't mean God's going to forgive them if they turn and go their own way and are not you know, repentant of what they've done, but there is repentance with God that he might be found. So verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. They can be blotted out. You've just killed the Son of God, but they can be blotted out. And he says, When the times of refreshing or cooling, that word means, shall come from the presence of the Lord, like this cool breeze that just comes upon this desert landscape. That's what the kingdom to him felt like. This cool breeze is just going to completely rejuvenate the earth. Very similar to David's words in 2 Samuel 23. And he says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, the one you've just killed, by the way, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. What a beautiful turn of phrase, isn't it? It's going to be this restitution, this rejuvenating of all things that God's spoken by his prophets. It's not like part of it's going to be fulfilled, the rest, no, well, it's a bit fanciful. It's all going to be fulfilled. Everything that God has spoken by his prophets is going to be there. And it's going to be brought about by the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's just a wonderful time. And, and for some people, that's really going to strike a chord. I mean, we were just um, down near Glenelg yesterday and there was this Extinction Rebellion you know, crowd that were catching the tram down to the end of Jetty Road to sort of have a stage of protest on climate change and the fact that we're all going to die and the planet's going to be burnt up. I was surprised they were catching the tram didn't know how sustainable that was but it was it was just yet another they were really serious and about where mankind's heading without god under the sun that they'd be right wouldn't they we're eventually going to kill ourselves if our world just keeps going on the way it is and what's going to happen to our future generations and so that's what they're trying to raise awareness to so you can understand that from a human point of view and we're just so blessed that we can have a Bible here that says, do you know what? The mouth of the Holy Prophet spoke about something completely different. And it says there's going to be a time of refreshing. No matter man, what man does, God's will is going to be front and centre in the world. And we believe very soon. And so this time of refreshing is certainly something that can strike a chord with a lot of people, especially worried about our planet and where it's heading. One other area we want to look at is in Hebrews 6, verse 4 and 5. We haven't really seen this. We haven't seen this at all in our life. Um, but it was something for them uh, back in the first century where they did have the Holy Spirit gifts. That's kind of another subject, I guess, on its own, why they uh, petered out. But they had this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. It didn't stop them ageing. It didn't stop them sinning or anything like that. But they did have certain gifts that were given them to help um, with the first century preaching that happened. And it's just, but it's something, once again, that can just give us a little snapshot into the kingdom and think, yes, I want to be there and it's going to be so wonderful. So Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 4 and 5, where Paul says, I believe it's Paul anyway, he says, for it is impossible, he says, for those who were once enlightened, we've learned about the truth, we've learned about what God wants, we've tasted of the heavenly gift, that's the Holy Spirit gifts, and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. That word, well, the idea of age. The powers of the age to come. He goes on to say, if they should fall away, he says, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God. So what he's saying is, it's, it seems to be impossible that somebody that has tasted not only of the word of God, what we've read and what we can read now, but also the powers of the age to come. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And when you start thinking, what were those powers? What well, was to raise the dead, to help those people that have got chronic illnesses, that now it's just a one-way street, okay? You could help those people. You could guide people. You could fix their brains that were having some sort of mental illness. Remember Jesus with Legion and fixed him up so he could actually be in his right mind and understand the things of God. And imagine having those powers of the age to come and Paul's there scratching his head going, how on earth can you then go back to your life that you had before that? It doesn't make sense. Okay? And so it's a wonderful, just a little snapshot in a couple of verses that says that must have been a pretty incredible experience that the brethren and sisters in that first century had. 
of the Holy Spirit gifts and the fact that they are powers of the age to come, of that world to come, that we will, God willing, have as immortal beings if we accept Christ and become his disciples that we can have to help the world in a real meaningful way. And so that's just a, a couple of verses, I think, that are, are really precious. They really show us a, a wonderful insight into the, the world to come and why we want to be there. And then Romans 7, our big, big problem that we all have. So all these other things I've mentioned, you know, at different times in our life, they might appeal to us more or less, like we're ageing, etc., whatever it might be, got issues with the justice system, who knows what, whatever it might be, the kingdom's there as an answer. But for all of us, we can't escape Romans chapter 7 as being a problem that we've all got. And that is sin. And so sin is there, and even in the Apostle Paul's life, after he converted to Christianity, he had that in his mind all the time. And because he was keeping himself so close to God, so close to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, he even said, you know, be ye imitators of me as I am of Jesus. He therefore felt the battle so more keenly than maybe somebody who's a bit more half-hearted in the service of Christ. He felt that battle really, really keenly and sharply because he was kept every day trying to make sure that he didn't sin. And so he, this Romans 7 is like his opening up of himself to us all to say it's a real battle and I'm so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so just coming in at verse, and you could almost read the whole chapter, but just coming in um, at verse 18 where he says, For I know, he says, that in me, he says, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. He says, while I'm in this mortality, there's something in me that's not good, and that is our human nature. He says, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. We think, well, Paul did lots of good, and yes, he did, but there was still lots of his life where he kept, fe kept feeling like that good was eluding him because of the pull of his nature. He says, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil that I would not, that I do. So this is a real confession, isn't it? This is a really telling us all about, you know, what it was like to be the Apostle Paul. And he's sharing this with us, just like David did in his Psalms, to teach people about sin and how powerful it is. Don't be fooled by it, because if somebody like Paul confesses and says, do you know what, it actually is a really strong influence in my life, and I'm fighting it every day, then it's going to be like that for us all. Not unless we've just given into it totally, and we just, uh, yeah, whatever. You know, But for Paul, he's showing us it's a real battle in all of us. So he says in verse 21, he says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Just like a law of gravity. Walk off a cliff, we fall. All right? There's a law in our body, it's so easy to sin. All right? And when good's there, evil is knocking on its door saying, actually, here's another way. So he says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. That man that's growing in me that is being put there by the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, delights after God's law. But he says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so he's got this battle that's going on each and every day of his life that he just finds himself being wretched, torn between what he wants to do and sin. And he's just so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that he can have forgiveness through him and the fact that he has provided the answer for us all through his death and resurrection that we can have eternal life. And his vision, oh, his vision of the kingdom we, we know so much about the kingdom in the New Testament because of Paul. Because he's there battling with this. He's also got health issues like we were talking about earlier. He's got health issues and he's just waiting for the kingdom, the redemption of his body, he talks about. Because he's got so many fronts that he just wants that kingdom to come. So much so that, you know, when he doesn't know how the outcome of his trial is going to go, in one of the letters he says, you know, I'd actually rather have the end of it now and therefore the next waking moment would be of Christ. But he says, I actually think I will hang around because I need to help you guys out. So that's probably the way it's going to go at this stage. So he's there so much looking forward to the kingdom and why and the reasons that he wanted to be there. 
And so that's really poignant for all of us, I think, and that's kind of really how we, we, we can really take to heart that picture of the kingdom because we're all living daily with sin and that is the answer to it. To feel that we can walk through the earth being unburdened by that mortality that we have. So if we go to Revelation 22, always a good spot to end at the very end, uh, Revelation 22. Because it's fitting, isn't it, that there's this sort of unburdened you know, vision that's there right at the very end of um, the book of uh, Revelation, which is the last book in our Bible. So Revelation 22, verse 3, it says, very simply, remember what we said, that there was this vanity that God has allowed us to be subject to because of our human failing? Well, he says, verse 3, there shall be no more curse. It's like, is that like that time of refreshing that we talked about from Acts? That refreshing, cooling wind that's just going to sweep over us. No more curse. But he says, but the throne of God and of his Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So it's not anybody and everybody and people that don't want to know about God. No, it's not. It's his servants. And we need to know what that means to become his servants, his sons and daughters. All right, his servants will serve him and just feel so good as a result. And just skipping down to verse 6, and he, he says, And he said unto me, the angel said unto John, These sayings are faithful and true. Just like those prophets, the holy prophets of old that we talked about. He says, All those things that the holy prophets said will come to pass, Peter says. He says, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets comes out again. The Lord God of the holy prophets. The ones that prophesied about this time. He says, sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. It's just such a wonderful vision to be unburdened of that sin that we read about in Romans chapter 7. And just skipping ahead to verses 10 to 14. Where he says unto John, and he said unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And here is our take-home message to each of us to think about. Of all that we've had of the picture of that kingdom and the, the very personal implications it can have in our lives and the help that it can give us to look forward to, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Time of the kingdom comes, there won't be time for redressing our thoughts then, he says. It's a time for action now. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he, though, that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Well, thank you very much, Dan, for your words this evening. And it's very encouraging for us all that not only knowing about the kingdom is such a great thing, but also what part we can play, even though we are essentially miserable people. And I couldn't help but read the very end of Romans 7, where it says that, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So next week we have another talk at the same time and that one is Is God 1 or 3? So you're welcome back, please, to listen in to that one. We will have a light supper afterwards, so please join us in having a cold drink. Come down, ask Dan any questions you might have as well. But we'll close now. If you stand up, we'll just say a prayer. Thank you. Our great, all-wise, loving Heavenly Father, 
Dear God, we seek you now to say thank you for this evening. Thank you for this quiet time where we can sit and open your word, the Bible, our instruction book for life, to learn from its pages, to understand it, to learn more about thee and that great plan and purpose of this earth. That as truly as you live, the whole earth will be filled with your glory. And we cannot wait for that time to be soon. We thank you for the refreshments that we enjoy, the food that gives us strength. We thank you for being with us. Keep us strong and keep us on that straight and narrow path that leads to your glory. We pray that you will be with us all as we leave this place and travel home and help us to always think on thee as we seek you through your Son, the Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen.